If you were to ask a Total Drama fan what the most forgettable season of the show was, you'd get one of two answers. Either Pakatu Island or some other season if they forgot that Pakatu ever existed. Coming right at the end of the traditional Total Drama seasons, it's easy to forget that there was ever a season past All Stars, but with the new Total Drama reboot finally ready to come out seemingly later this year, now is the perfect time to dive back into the last season of the show we got and see what we can perhaps expect in the upcoming seasons. I would give a spoiler warning here. Here, but let's be honest, if you had any intention of watching this season, you would have done it already. This is Dodo Drama Akatel Island! Before getting into the characters, let's first take a look at the general concept of the season and the challenges that go along with it. Unlike every season before it, there are a couple arguments that can be made for what exactly this season's gimmick is. For the first couple of episodes, it seems like this season is all about taking the summer camp survivor mix of the first season and removing the summer camp, as there's no given food or shelter in this season. This seems like it should be a big deal as the first episode establishes that one team has a grandiose treehouse while the other one just lives in a cave, but it ends up not really mattering over the rest of the season. It would be kind of cool if a team lost a challenge for not being able to find food or get enough sleep, but they kind of just move past that being a part of the season pretty early on. There's also a small emphasis on some Cree influence, such as the team names I'm going to tactically avoid trying to pronounce, but that also fades into the background. Instead, a majority of the season focuses more so on the artificial nature of the island. This comes in a couple of different ways, the first of which being the random changes in the environment spotted mostly by Jasmine. This does add a pretty fun air of mystery to the first few episodes, and I would argue that the payoff to it at the end of Hurl and Go Seek is really one of the biggest highlights of the season. Just the mass chaos at the end of the episode feels really fun and unique for a series like Total Drama. This part of the season also plays a big role in Scarlet Fever in the finale, but I'll talk about those a little bit later in the video. Overall, I think the concept's pretty solid, although it's fully introduced too late into the season for most of the challenges outside of the two episodes I just mentioned to have anything to do with it. Instead, we have the worst challenges in the series present here. Almost every single one feels like a more boring version of a challenge earlier in the show. Chase X, do Y, go to Z, etc. There are just generally very few challenges worth remembering here, as since they wanted to keep the artificial nature of the island secret, most of the challenges have to be as vanilla as possible. And that's actually a pretty good way to describe the general vibe this season goes for. Vanilla. There are some things that the season does to try and feel unique. The different joke restaurants that supply the reward for winning each challenge for example, make up some of the funniest gags of the season, but besides some moments towards the end that feel like the show is actually experimenting with its format, the first solid chunk of the season feels like a vessel for the characters to tell jokes and get themselves eliminated. Speaking of which... I gave it my best try, but now I have to say goodbye. While every season of the show has some characters that end up being nothing more than their gimmick, mostly out of necessity to have some eliminations before there's enough time for characterization, I would argue that this season has it worst of all, with the first seven eliminations all feeling extra gimmicky, and it's pretty generous to stop that count at seven. Since these seven characters don't interact a ton with everybody else, let's go ahead and knock them out one by one. First up is Beardo, the perfect first elimination candidate. He gets in the episode, gets off his gags, and gets right eliminated for being useless, all without forming any connections with any of the cast or showing any potential. While this role could have been filled by simply reducing the character count, some of the beatboxing and sound effects do get a chuckle in the first 22 minutes. Not a bad character in the slightest, but no tears shed at his early boot. Next up is Leonard, who is perhaps the total drama character most disconnected from reality and thus exists purely for gags. Leonard's back and forth with both Sugar and Dave are hard to listen to, and there's never really a moment where this inclusion feels warm. Warranted. Along with Beardo, these two guys have very little to talk about regarding their time on the show, as their best attributes is the lack of potential lost with their eliminations. The next two characters to take a look at, Amy and Sammy, definitely have a bit more to talk about. Their dynamic for the first couple of episodes is entirely based on each other, and while this evolution of Katie and Sadie is an interesting concept and definitely has some moments to shine, Amy's borderline psychopathic behavior goes just a bit too far for it to really be an entertaining story. The Jasmine stuff with 
samey, especially after her sister's elimination, is definitely the best part of their collective story, but it still feels like it never really goes anywhere. I think the switching scheme really isn't necessary, and that a plot where Amy gets eliminated organically, and thus giving Sammy a couple episodes of development away from her sister, would have been better. But as it is, it's a nice distraction for a couple of episodes, while the main plots slowly get up and running. In between the eliminations of the twins is Rodney, whose gag of falling in love and breaking up with every girl on his team without their knowledge is funny about the first two times. Then it becomes the same scene in every episode until his eventual boot. While his inability to even attempt to tell the truth and I love you, I love you nots is one of the funniest moments of the season, every other moment with his character is a pretty big bore to watch. Similar story to Beardo and Leonard, although being around for four entire episodes feels like a lot for a character with such minuscule amounts of depth. Just like every Q girl on this show who gets eliminated before Merge, the fandom seemingly all agrees that Ella should have stuck around longer. And yeah, while I would love to be a contrarian, I think there is definitely a path for Ella to have been a bigger player in the season. Seeing her get slowly corrupted by the nature of the competition is an idea I've had ever since seeing this season about 10 years ago, but enough about what could have been, let's talk about what we actually got which is fine, I guess. Ella's main interactions with the rest of the cast mostly involve Sugar hating her, which reflects more on Sugar than on her, and her crush on Dave, which feels so incredibly out of nowhere and mostly exists just to push Sky and Dave forward while pretending to be about the princess finding her prince or something. I'm ultimately okay with the no singing rule being what gets her eliminated, but it coming via goading from Sugar is seemingly just to make Sugar into the season villain she was never meant to be, so it doesn't exactly feel satisfying. I will say though, Ella's farewell song is by far the best ending for any character this season, although perhaps that's more of a function of this season's apathy towards its cast. Either way, Ella is probably the best character in this section, and the only one who I really think had enough potential to go further. Of course, that statement kind of implies my thoughts on the final character character eliminated in the first half, Topher. Besides having the most creative name in the entire franchise, Topher just doesn't feel necessary. He has almost zero relations with anybody besides Chris, and even when he and Jasmine have multiple scenes of just them, it still feels like they're just doing gags around each other with no actual interaction. His ending is easy to see from a mile away, and while it does give Chris some desperately needed screen time, this arc could have definitely been wrapped up quite a few episodes earlier. One quick note on Chris before we move on, this is by by far his worst season. Obviously him as a character has never been a focal point of the show, but his comedic value and likability just go completely down the drain here. And I don't really even think that's entirely a function of him just being at his most cruel, it really just seems like poor writing and a lack of pre-built dynamics with the cast to fall back on. Add that in with the fact that Chef has about a dozen lines total across 14 episodes, and it just ends up being a pretty anticlimactic place to end the characters after six seasons. Anyway, back to the campers, all seven of them have one thing in common. They never escape or deviate from their stereotypes. No character development for any of these guys, and while that's unfortunately not something unique to them in this season, these guys don't really impact the season in any meaningful way. While plucking out any of the next seven characters we're going to talk about would drastically change the season, taking out any of Ella, Topher, Beardo, Leonard, Rodney, or the joint package of Amy and Sammy would have little to no impact on the general storyline. So while this is true of some characters in all of the seasons, it feels like it's at its worst here, with half the contestants feeling useless and without the comedic gold of the first couple of seasons to hold it up. I am not your sidekick! Scarlet, you look different. When it comes to pairings between genders in total drama, Scarlet and Max is one of the only ones that remains completely platonic outside of a few jokes, which is actually pretty neat. Unfortunately, the writing between these characters is abysmal for most of the time they're on screen together, which they are for a surprisingly large chunk of the time across the first 10 episodes. Max is annoying the entire time, albeit intentionally, while Scarlet is annoying the entire time unintentionally, as the show's constant winking to the audience that she's perhaps not the innocent nerd that she pretends to be feels less like it's setting up the big reveal in her title episode, and more like it's just spoiling it. Speaking of which, Scarlet Fever, the 10th episode in this 13 episode season, is where it all comes to a head, where the show rushes Scarlet's arc to an admittedly ambitious finale. And yeah, I have to say, this episode is arguably the most cinematic the series ever gets, but coincidentally also the least total drama total drama has ever felt. 
Either way, I actually enjoy the character dynamics of each pairing in this episode, and it would probably be my favorite of the season if the show didn't fumble the ending. Super genius Scarlet falling for an obviously fake Chris bot feels less than satisfying for her character, ultimately just feeling the show wanting to be done with her arc. This feeling is compounded with the elimination of Max, who's just thrown into the canon as a way to not have to write him as a character outside of his relationship with Scarlet. Anyway you slice it when you take into account screen time, this is probably my least favorite aspect of the season. Sure, there are individual moments with these characters that are funny, and Scarlet is a good villain for about five minutes, but the kind of plot the season wants to have with these characters ultimately just doesn't fit in the total drama framework. While I appreciate a lot of what it goes for, it's hard to find nice things to say about Max and Scarlet's role in this season, other than the fact that they get out of the way for the final four, and that the show doesn't have Scarlet's downfall be an attraction for Max, which somehow would have been even worse than what we got. As for how I would fix it, I don't really know if it's salvageable. I guess there are some small tweaks you can make, like fully going all in on Scarlet being the villain and perhaps having her pull some strings to cause some eliminations early, as well as having Max be at least somewhat responsible for her eventual downfall, but even with these additions, I still think that this duo, while a clever idea, was doomed from the start. I can get us out of this, but it ain't gonna be pretty. Can you handle it? Um, I have no idea what Sugar is about to do but I am 147% sure I can't handle it. I don't hate Sugar as a character for this season. For almost every character in Packet 2, how funny they are is solely based on their gimmick, and Sugar has to be up there for having one of the funniest ones in the season. The hillbilly pageant queen jokes work a solid minority of the time, which based on how frequently the season stalls for minutes at a time without any real attempts at comedy, is heavily appreciated. Her beef with Ella never really goes anywhere interesting, but overall, in the half of the show that's pre-merge, she's pretty solid in just adding chaos to every single episode. But then, you get to merge, and the show realizes it has to have a villain, seemingly just forgetting to ever make one, and just sliding sugar into this role. And yeah, it's not a great fit. The show has to constantly come up with ways for Sugar to magically get invincibility in almost every episode leading up to her elimination, and because of her less than athletic stature and this season's emphasis on who is the fastest or strongest type challenges, it doesn't exactly feel natural. Her elimination of Jasmine is probably the worst defender of this, as Jasmine seemingly does everything possible to make it so that Sugar can fill her villain role all the way to the final three. And perhaps that's the biggest trouble with Sugar being this season de facto antagonist is that she has to stick around for 12 episodes. Sure, I think she's a funnier character than most fans give her credit for, but there's only so many fart jokes and haha she's me moments that one can take before you start to question if she was ever funny in the first place. Her last episode, packed with talent, does give her a fairly good send off, although her lack of evil deeds as a season antagonist does limit the punishment the show can give her. Instead, chooses to give her a country rap song outro that's also up there for one of the funniest moments in the season. The entire episode is building up to the reveal of Sugar's talent, and for the episode and her time in the show to end with such a disastrous performance couldn't be more fitting with what they ultimately tried to accomplish with her character. Overall, despite being the third place finisher in the season, Sugar really just doesn't get enough screen time to develop her role as an antagonist. Instead, we just get peeks into what seems to be a more strategic version of the character whenever she's not just doing an Owen parody. While I don't think that Sugar is the reason for the season's demise that many see her as, there's no denial that for the season antagonist who's almost in every episode, it's hard to not expect at least a little bit more than what we got. Jasmine's a zombie! I should have helped her! I messed up! And I know what I have to do. <laughs> Welcome to the most vaguely positive part of this entire video. Note that I'm leaving the finale for its own section at the end of the video, so we're just going to cover the first 12 episodes of the Sean and Jasmine experience. Starting off with them as individuals, Jasmine takes second place for most normal character on the island. Besides being Australian and tall, there really isn't that much completely off the wall with her. Almost all the jokes about her character have to do with the latter, and while I wish there was perhaps a larger focus on her Aussie origins, I do appreciate the comedic value in having her dominate the competition and intimidate all the guys on the island. However, most of her appearance in the show is in relation to Sean, whose character is less reliant on the existence of their relationship, as his obsession with the undead characterizes most of his appearances in the season. In most seasons, Sean would be one of the more wacky characters, but here in Pakatu Island, where God got bored halfway through all stars and left, he's arguably like the fourth most sane person in this competition. Both of these characters rank among the most tolerable by themselves, with Sean's fear of zombies 
Hercules being one of the funniest gags the show doesn't run into the ground. But after about five episodes in, they become the secondary couple of the season. The fight they have over Sean knocking Jasmine off the walkway to avoid elimination instead of being able to read her mind somehow feels both drawn out as it takes multiple episodes to resolve and rushed as they get very little screen time despite this. But besides this little bit of drama, their relationship works pretty well as a fun little side distraction from the other pair that we'll get to in a second. The size difference between them, as well as the difference in mental clarity, provides for some great jokes as Jasmine slowly lowers her standards as Sean's condition becomes more and more clear. The second development between these two comes right before Jasmine's elimination, with Sean lying about his intent to split the money. The writing of this plot, at least at the beginning, is surprisingly nuanced despite the season's nature, and it sets up Jasmine's return in the finale pretty well, but I'll save that for the end of the video. Anyway, as individuals, Sean and Jasmine are both pretty solid characters each, and while they don't work as a couple quite as well as some of the best in the franchise, it works well enough to give each character something to do until the finale, so I'll save any more discussion of them until the end of the video. Speaking of which, I think we've covered every character this season, so I guess we can go ahead and move into... Oh yeah, I guess we do actually have to talk about Dave and Sky. To start from the beginning, Dave and Sky initially stand out against the wackiness of their competition, as Dave's whole thing is being normal for the first few episodes, and Sky's only gimmick is vaguely wanting to be an Olympian, as one does, I guess. Dave shows signs of being a germaphobe, and Sky, well, I'm not really sure what Sky does besides just generally being nice to people, but once they start dating, it just becomes Mike and Zoe 2.0, except if Mike was just a loser instead of having DID, and if Zoe was, well actually no, Zoe and Skye are pretty much the exact same character. After the team switch, Dave completely begins his transition into the season's punching bag, with Skye abandoning her old character and joining the rest of the show and bullying him. Jasmine goading Skye into doing this feels unnatural the entire time, and the friendship between Sean and Dave that follows, while initially showing some promise, eventually devolves into the same joke about Dave being a loser and worth laughing at. After Dave's eventual self-elimination and hurling go see, an episode that could have been one of my favorites in the post-World Tour era of the show, if not for its insistence to break up its neat zombies concept and aesthetic for some of the most over-the-top gross out in the show, Sky's purpose in the show becomes sticking around Sugar for a couple episodes to get out of Sean and Jasmine's way until the finale, as besides a quick moment in Scarlet Fever, she pretty much pretends Dave never existed. Her little rivalry with Sugar in these two episodes before Sugar's elimination does somewhat box Sean out of mattering for a bit, and and packed with talent, but it does give her some semblance of a character outside of just being a Zoe with a loser Mike. And honestly, it ends up being my favorite piece of her story in the season. The dynamic between her and Sugar has some really funny jokes, and it does somewhat feel like Sky learning the consequence of her overtrusting personality as Sugar exploits everything that Sky liked about herself. It's the kind of character development this season desperately lacks, so I would have loved to have it started earlier in the season, it's still a rare enjoyable moment. Anyway, unless I'm forgetting something, I think we can actually get into the finale this time. The last episode in the original Total Drama run, Lies, Cries, and One Big Prize. It's finale time on Total Drama Bacatera! Unlike the majority of finales in this series, this one only features the two finalists and their respective significant others, leaving most of the cast to never be seen again. While this is definitely disappointing, it should at least leave some time to really develop and finish Sky and Sean's plots, right? You already know that it doesn't. The first scene in this episode tries to be a bit creative in showing the differences between Sean and Sky, but the show gets bored of actual character development and takes us into reunion time, with Jasmine and Dave being shoved back into the fray. This episode then becomes entirely about the two pairs, completely ignoring what had the potential to be a great challenge. I mean seriously, utilizing the ability to control the island could lead to some ridiculously cool challenges, but it's more just jumping and running and oh wait, it's already over. Chris using confessionals and audition tapes to drive a wedge in between the couple sounds like a good idea, but the show never had any intention to resolve the conflict started here, instead just choosing to make Dave as whiny as possible in this episode so the viewer doesn't feel bad when Jasmine and Sean get back together for no reason while Dave is stuck to die, I guess. I don't feel like I need to repeat my thoughts on why I dislike the split winner aspect of the series, but it feels extra useless here, as the only difference is really who holds the case at the end of the episode. Overall, while not the worst season finale the show has ever done, it's definitely more 
fitting to Packet 2's overall quality than it is good. In conclusion, Packet 2 Island is proof that Total Drama can't rest on its concept alone and still produce a great season. Yes, an animated teenager version of Survivor is still as uniquely fantastic a concept as it was 15 years ago. And yes, it does still keep this abysmally written slog somewhat watchable, but without the fantastic character-based humor of the first three seasons, there's not much keeping it from becoming stale. That isn't to say that the season is terrible, there are still some characters that are pretty humorous throughout, but the writing just continues to fall from grace like it did in All Stars. Of course, some of the fault for this is the 13 episode season, as it's not coincidental that the best four seasons of the show are of the 26th episode variety, including Redonculus Race, but still, Revenge of the Island proved that you can introduce 14 characters in 13 episodes in a way that feels way better than Pakatu ever does. And with a reboot doing the same, I hope that it takes notes from the show's history, or else it could definitely become a Pakatu Island 2.0, and then we'll have to wait 10 more years for more total drama. Anyway, that's about it for me. If you have any ideas for shows I should cover, or just want to yell at me for calling Sky a Zoe clone, you can find me in the comments or at Twitter. Either way, this has been April Samuel, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks with a much more positive video. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.